on the board because you need to help stabilize other fractures, that's reasonable. But if you got enough people, get them off that board. Um, delivery, childbirth. So our EMTs are expected to do childbirth. I took a group of EMTs to Jeff State recently, and we practiced delivering plastic babies, right? Um, uh, the good news with deliveries, if you uh, need a doctor, it's a bad day for everybody. Man, y'all are quick. Good job. Good job. Uh, but we do expect our EMTs to be able to deliver babies, right? So that's kind of yeah. kind of crazy. We got docs again to do 12 years of education to do this. Um, if everything goes well with the delivery, so be it. If it doesn't, I can't help you. Medics can't help you. You need a surgeon, an OB surgeon. And just because it's Talladega weekend, I have to throw that in there. Any NASCAR fans? No, good. All right, great. Thank you very much. I like watching the wrecks. But if you look at the scope of practice for the EMT, this is not basic. There are a lot of things these guys can do. Technically, they can use CPAP. They can use BiPAP if their ventilators available. They can use capnography. So my point to all this is for the EMTs, um, uh, our state has a lot of advanced protocols for you guys, more than some states. Uh, and for the medics and the advanced EMTs and the training officers, let your EMTs get some training. Don't just throw them in the back of the rescue to go to the hospital with the patient. Talk out loud when you assess your patients, when you're thinking about what you're doing for your patients, so the EMT knows what's going on. With the current staffing models that I see all over, um, we got to train these guys up. The meds for the EMT, they can do now. They can carry Tylenol. Uh, in the past, we talked about the EMT can assist with medications. In reality, that has now changed. The EMT can use albuterol off the engines or off your rescue. They can give aspirin, they can give glucose, they can give Narcan. There's no more assisting. These are medicines the EMT can use and give, and it's all legit. There are limits of risk to most of this. The only people that I don't give Tylenol to is if they know they have liver disease and they're bright yellow, they're glowing yellow, I don't give them Tylenol. Otherwise, Tylenol is pretty safe even in pregnancy. For the albuterol, there's really limited risk for that. Now, a 90-year-old that's got a heart rate of you know 130 already, I'm probably not going to give them albuterol. And unless they're breathing 40 times a minute and I think they're about to die from their COPD or asthma, then they get it. That albuterol is a relatively safe drug. Um, you can do uh, every uh, three minutes as needed. There's really no max dose for that. Aspirin. Uh, for chest pain, the EMT can do that as well. Uh, my advice is that for the uh, chest pain at the EMT level, if the patient has a history of GI bleeds, any allergy to the medicine, are they taking aspirin or any other anti uh, nonsteroidal anti inflammatory in the past day? Don't give it to them. That's different at the medic level when you can look at a 12 lead, but for just chest pain at the EMT level, they should not be given aspirin for any history of GI bleed or any uh, non sterile anti inflammatory in the past 24 hours. Cool thing about the EMT level, they can do 12 leads. So if you're running the BLS truck or have an engine that has a life pack on it, you can set it to AED mode. And the EMT that's first on scene can do a 12 lead. If that 12 lead reads STEMI, state rules, so they can actually put them in the STEMI system and uh, augment and get ALS transport there to get them where they need to go. The EMT should not be able to read a 12 lead, understandably, but they can do a 12 lead and transmit that. Oh, oh bless you. You got excited, I thought you had a question. I was pumped for a second. Uh, then you let me down. And then nitro. So nitro is not, uh, not in the formulary. Uh, last time I looked on the web page, uh, so the EMT can still assist people with their own nitro. Uh, but technically cannot use it off the engine or rescue. Uh, and obviously the contraindications would be hypotension and blood pressure, I would say less than 100 systolic. I would say bradycardia, rates less than 60, heart rates greater than 100. And then obviously we already talked about the medication use as well. Because if you pop somebody a nitro that's on one of these medicines and you don't have a way to give IV fluids, you probably just put them into a, a pretty bad spot. Yes, ma'am. Perspective as far as getting nitro, uh, with somebody in uh, the right side of the heart failure. In rice. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I think if their blood pressure is reasonable and they're not bradycardic, it's still fine if they need it. So if I got somebody sitting there saying chest pain, the dopperic, the hypertensive, heart rate's 90, 100 or something, I'm probably going to pop them in nitro, even if I know they have right sided heart failure. There's been some controversy. There has. 
Yeah, and there's controversy about giving it to. Uh, yeah, now even. Yeah, so same thing with the right side of the MI. So um, if someone is having a, a real right ventricular infarct and they're in a heart block, their heart rate's 30 or 40, they're going to fall out of the ability to give them nitro anyway. But I give nitro to inferior STEMIs all the time. Um, but you need to have IV access and then be ready with the fluid. So if you drop the pressure, you can fix that. Um, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, what's that old joke? If you got two doctors in the room and you ask their opinion, you get six opinions, right? Um, so I think it's relatively safe. I think if someone, there's no way the EMT is going to know if they're having an MI or not, right? They're just going to have chest pain as a complaint, right? Um, so they're going to look at the bottles. If the blood pressure is greater than 100, heart rate's less than 100, greater than you know 50 or 60, it's reasonable to think about helping them with their nitro if they have it. At the paramedic level, and you look at that EKG and it's, yep, this is an inferior STEMI, as long as the pressure is okay, you're fine giving them some nitro if they're having active chest pain. Semi-inappropriate humor. <laughs> All right. Yeah, they make good money there too, let me tell you. The red beans and rice are nice. <clears throat> Good job. Good. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the advanced EMT, there's some big changes at the advanced EMT level. Uh, they are now advanced life support. Uh, it's really moving more toward the uh, intermediate that we went away from years ago. So pretty important stuff. This is their med list now at the advanced EMT level. So they got the Tylenol like everybody else does now, Ibuterol, Aspirin. They can start doing antibiotics, Procephalin or Cephalazolin or Ancef. Uh, these are antibiotics we'll put in. These are optional. You can tell by the asterisk, uh, but it's a, like a penicillin type antibiotic that can be used for different things. Uh, Cephazolin or Ancef is uh, used for uh, skin infections for the most part. That's a good drug for open fractures. So if you got somebody who's got an open tip fib, tip, tip fib, nasty wound, and you know you're going to be an hour and a half away from the hospital, yeah, they need a couple of grams of Ancef. May help prevent them from losing that leg. Um, ceftriaxone or rocephin is a broad-based um, third-generation cephalosporin. We use it for UTIs. We use it for, uh, oh, I just talk about the dose. We use it for urine, urinary tract infections. It can be used for community-acquired pneumonia. It can be used if you have a real bad weekend at Talladega, right? So it can be used for a lot of things as well. Um, most thing that uh, we put in the protocol for is to be used for sepsis. So you think about someone who has sepsis, it's the person who has a source of infection, who is now tachycardic, hypotensive, altered. They have a big risk of dying pretty quick with you. Um, however, I think my argument would be that these people need aggressive IV fluid resuscitation, maybe pressure support with push dose epi or dopamine or whatever else you're carrying. Um, if you're gonna use Rocephin, my advice would be make sure that the hospital that you transport to knows that you're doing that because there are some core measures at the hospital that they have to do to bill Medicaid, Medicare to get paid for this patient care, such as getting blood cultures and time to antibiotics and make sure they're okay with you doing this so that you're all on the same page so you don't burn any bridges with that. Um, if you have somebody that you know clinically, you don't have a doubt they're in septic shock, yeah, you're gonna manage the airway, you're gonna set them up, give them fluids, think about controlling the low blood pressure. And if you got the Rocephin, they're gonna get that at that point. Just remember that the more we give people Rocephin that don't need it, the more resistance we get. And at some point, the antibiotic won't be useful anymore if we jack it up. So we just gotta be wise if we're gonna do it. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying you just gotta be wise. Most of the places that I'm working as a medical director, we're not carrying Rocephin at this point. Um, I do think that carrying the, the Cephazolin or Ancef is reasonable for those open fractures, uh, low risk, high benefit, may preserve a lot of limb that way. And this is just talking about how you manage shock. It's in the protocols. Again, it's ABCs, aggressive IV fluid resuscitation. We talked about the antibiotics. And then you got different ways to control hypotensive. You can do push dose epi, as long as you know how to correctly do that. If you don't, I would recommend practicing before you do that. Practice at the uh, station where you go out and practice on your patients. Dopamine is still out there. We used to use dopamine a lot for sepsis in the hospitals. Um, we've kind of gone away from that. We're using norepi or levofed now. Uh, but if you got dopamine, dopamine still works regardless of what the hospitals say. The, there was one question. Yeah, so 
If you look, it talks about continued signs of hypoperfusion, repeat fluid boluses, if no history of CHF or signs of fluid overload. And I would say my advice for places that I'm working is I will continue fluid, uh, aggressive fluid resuscitation as long as I don't see signs of fluid overload. There are a lot of people that have right sided heart failure that can tolerate fluid. There are people that have heart failure that can tolerate fluid because they're dehydrated. If they're sitting upright, they're gurgling, their sats are low, they don't need IV fluids, right? Um, if the blood pressure is low, they look like dirt and they're not gurgling, they need IV fluids to get that blood pressure up, okay? Don't stay on scene for an hour and a half to give them two liters, but start the fluid. Don't be concerned about giving them a liter or two if you have to, and this they're gurgling. And that's not a medical term, gurgling. All right, tough crowd. Thank you for smiling, Dr. Payne, or Dr. Brown. I was thinking, what is the actual term for it? For gurgling? I think it's uh, gurgling. I have no idea. <laughs> I think you can say they have uh, rails and all lung fields maybe, but gurgling is bad. Glucose, the advanced MD can give glucose if you can find it. D10, D25, D50, whatever you got. Benadryl, so uh, Vance, if you can give Benadryl. Benadryl uh, is over the counter, orally. Everybody uses it, thinks it's a pretty safe drug. And for most things it is, but when you give it IV, there are some risks to this. Uh, Benadryl is a, a old generation antipsychotic in young kids across the blood brain barrier. It can make them actually kind of go apneic. So infants is kind of uh, concerning sometimes. And then older folks that you give Benadryl, Benadryl to, it can make them get delirious. They can go from being normal active have a little rash, you give them a big dose of Benadryl, now they're confused and altered, they're walking around, they fall, they break their hip, have bad problems with that. So remember, every drug has a risk and a benefit. Um, the places that I'm working at, I like using IV Benadryl on the patient who just had anaphylaxis and we hit them with IM Epi, or the person who's <clears throat> having a significant allergic reaction. Uh, we also use Benadryl if we're still using old school Haldol. That helps sedate the person, right? And sometimes those old uh, antipsychotics like Haldol or Geodon will cause dystonic reactions and Benadryl fixes that. So just remember, be wise. Um, and some of these medications were not taught in the e advanced EMT class uh, of the guys that you have working with you now. <clears throat> this is the cool one. So the advanced EMT can give Epi 1 to 10,000, 1 to 10 for cardiac arrest, All right? Are y'all still able to get the Bristol Jets to 1 to 10,000 or you gotta make your own Epi here now? A little bit of both, yeah. So my advice is to make sure that the advanced EMT is practicing making the epi from one to one to the one to 10. My other advice is if the advanced EMT draws that epi up and they make that one to 10,000, that they give the drug. You don't mix a drug, not label it, and hand it to your partner, somebody can get hurt with that. So my advice is if you're drawing up epi in a cardiac arrest, if you advanced EMT, you draw it up, you push the drug. Limited risk though, all roads and cardiac arrest lead to epi whether you're in cardiac arrest from VFib, VTAC, asystole, or whatever, uh, first drug is epi. So the advanced EMT can do blind insertion devices, they can run a Lucas device, do cardiac arrest, they can use an AED if they're in VFib arrest, they can start a line, they can push first dose epi. So pretty useful. Okay. So it's tough to find this some places I'm working now, so a lot of times we're making it. The problem is it's tough to find some of these saline syringes now too. Uh, so you got to be creative. My only advice is whatever method that you're doing, make sure your people know how to do that. All right, it's poor form to push this straight. All right, it's poor form to mix this up. The patient gets a ROS back, somebody lays that syringe down, and then they go and flush an IV site when the medic gets there, right? And they flush it with epi and the patient that now was alive goes back into VFib arrest. So just be careful, all right? That drug is really good sometimes, but it can also jack you up. Y'all carrying cyano kit around here? Anybody carrying that? Anybody know the cost of it? A lot, more than my rent, right? It's uh, 900 bucks to uh, maybe 1500, depending on where you get it. Cyano kit really only works for cyanide poisoning. Uh, places that I'm working, uh, not carrying this in all the rescues or engines, but if you're, I think my advice, my, my thoughts, if you're a fire-based EMS, I would at least have one of these on a supervisor truck. Um, if someone has a inhalation injury, uh, you manage the airway as an ALS provider, they get intubated, you're bagging them, things are going great. They're still in PEA arrest, they're hypoxic. You think about inhalation drugs, um, issues, uh, this can actually save a life. Uh, so cyanokit, uh, expensive stuff, 
no way anybody can carry a lot of it, but having one or two doses to use centrally uh, for your folks or somebody that's in a, uh, in a enclosed space is pretty beneficial. There was a uh, house fire uh, in Birmingham uh, over the holidays. Uh, EMS did a great job. A fire did a great job getting the patient out of the, the structure. The patient was intubated, cardiac arrest, lupus, FE, everything went perfect. They were in PEA arrest. They transported to the hospital. When they got to me, I gave two doses of cyano kit. They went from PEA to perfusion rhythm. There was still a bad outcome due to the long-term hypoxia for the brain, but had that cyano kit been available and given in the first five, 10 minutes of the cardiac arrest, not at minute 40, there may have been a different outcome. May not have been, but it may have. So um, it is optional as is glucagon. Uh, I don't carry glucagon places that I work and they're, they're really rich, glucagon's expensive. Um, my thought if somebody is hypoglycemic, they can't get IV access and they're obtunded, they get an IO and get the D50, D25, whatever you got. If they're hypoglycemic and not obtunded, can still look around and talk, talk a little bit, they get oral glucose and we can't get an IV. LR is optional. Uh, every 10 years we flip flop back and forth between LR versus saline. The surgeons like LR, the docs like saline, they're both isotonic. If somebody's dying from hemorrhagic shock, you don't need either one of those, you need blood. So uh, LR, if it's cheaper than saline, get it. If not, no worries. This is the other cool thing at the advanced EMT. So the advanced EMT can now give Versed for seizures. They give it nasally, five milligrams intranasal. Um, can't give it IV yet. My thought is that it probably switched to IV in a couple of years in our state, uh, but it does kind of expand the scope for the folks that run just advanced EMT. Uh, now they can do something with that seizure. In the past, you'd have a EMT or an EMR driver and advanced guy in the back of the rescue, the patient seizing. They recognize that, they open the airway, they give supplemental O2, they ventilate, they check your AccuCheck, it's fine, they start fluids, and they sit there and they like, yep, you're still seizing. They drive to the hospital, right? Now we have some Versed that you can do. Remember, once you give somebody Versed, uh, after they stop seizing, they're gonna be tired and have respiratory problems from being postictal, and now they're gonna be have respiratory problems because they just got five of Versed. So the advanced should be able to manage that airway. Solumedrol, this stuff uh, is uh, required. Uh, it is uh, seven to eight bucks a dose, I think. So how you manage that depends on your finances. Uh, Solumedrol is a steroid, it's useful. Uh, my advice is I use it uh, post anaphylaxis, post that IM epi they get, and post the Benadryl, they can get Solumedrol to help with that because they were very sick. I was concerned about their well-being. Uh, the other people that I use Solumedrol would be folks who have bad asthma or COPD that make me uncomfortable. So the guy breathing 40 plus times a minute, big worker breathing, can't speak in a couple of word sentences. Once he gets NEP treatments and IV access, I'm thinking about magnesium, right? Then I'm gonna go ahead and pop him with solumedrol. People that don't need solumedrol as pregnant people and diabetics. You give somebody solumedrol as a diabetic, it's gonna shoot their glucose up. Now, uh, if they are sick and they're dying in front of you, they still get the solumedrol. We'll fix the hyperglycemia later. If they're pregnant, you don't want to give solumedrol. It can jack up the growth of the baby. But if mama's about to die from you from asthma or allergic reaction or anaphylaxis, they get solumedrol. Does that make sense? Everything we do is risk to benefit. There's a risk in everything we do and a benefit. Talked about solumedrol. Racemic epi can be used for uh, kids with croup or upper airway uh, edema. Uh, sometimes adults with uh, angioedema I'll use that as well. You can buy it in a 2.25% solution or you can make your own. Uh, the way you make it for peds is in our protocols. It is correct. It's three milligrams or three uh, cc's of one to 1,000 and just squirt that in your nebulizer and let it ride. Okay. Um, I've been underdosing for years. I still use about 0.5 to 1 cc of that, but you can use three. Thiamine, anybody carrying thiamine anymore? Okay, so it's optional. Talk to your med director. Some folks still like it. I probably used IV thiamine twice in the past 10 years. We don't use a lot in the hospital anymore. Um, if somebody needs it and they're not intubated, they get it orally. If they need it and they're intubated, we'll give it to them, but it's not an ER kind of drug much. Do you guys give thiamine? Yeah, we just, it used to be you had to give thiamine before you gave somebody glucose. If they're malnourished, you give them thiamine. Uh, you do it for altered mental status. It really doesn't affect anything acutely. Um, so places I'm work, I'm pulling thiamine, saving money to buy something else we need. All right. Tordol, Tordol is a required drug. 
Toradol is pretty cool. It's a non steroidal anti inflammatory. It's like IV Motrin. I say that, but let me clarify do not give Motrin IV. Okay. <laughs> do not crush it up and put it in the syringe and squirt it to your patients. Um, this is an IV preparation. Uh, it's a pretty good drug uh, for pain in young, healthy people, uh, especially MSK pain. Anybody have a kidney stone in the past? They're good for kidney stones. All right. The problem with Toradol is a couple of things, though. Um, one, Toradol is pretty tough on the kidney function. So people who have underlying kidney disease, one or two doses of Toradol could actually put them over the edge and make them good to dialysis. The other problem with Toradol is it's uh, pretty bad for pregnancy. You don't want to give Toradol to anybody that's pregnant. So um, I trust no one anymore. So if I have women of childbearing age with pain, they don't get Toradol until I get a blood test or a urine pregnancy test to prove they're not pregnant uh, because Toradol is pretty bad. Um, the other thing is uh, in the deep south, especially in the Birmingham area, probably up here too, um, what people are high risk for having kidney problems? What kind of patients? Diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and older people. Do y'all ever take care of those kind of people? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you laugh. Yeah, that's 98.3% of our patient population. <laughs> those folks are high risk for kidney disease. So those folks, I don't give it toward all to until I know what the kidney function is. My point is, if you got a young, healthy person with an ankle fracture, yeah, Toradol is wonderful. Um, other folks, be considerate, be concerned about kidney function. I'm actually uh, making Toradol category B most places I work um, where there's a high risk for kidney disease, these people. Uh, the other thing is I cut the dose down to 15 milligrams and not 30. We used to do 30 milligrams IV, 60 milligrams IM. Uh, I haven't done 30 milligrams IV in a long time. 15 is probably plenty with 30 being the max dose I am. Again, Toradol is a good drug, I'm not saying it's not, but it does have some concerns in certain patient populations, and unfortunately those patients are the ones that we take care of. So, and that's, I'm not saying to do that, it's your place, I'm just giving my advice on that and my thoughts. So, um, I show this picture a lot for you guys that watch online, you're probably sick of it, so I'm sorry. This is a neck, that's the ear, this is not somebody's groin, okay? So that's a big neck laceration. Um, and, and when you think about managing this on the scene at the EMT level, if that is bleeding out, all hands are on deck. Gloves are on, fingers in the hole, getting ready to pack the wound, stop the bleeding. At the advanced EMT level, now they can actually go in and give TXA as category A. Um, I know that I had some calls last week. The new the protocol has been updated on the web page. This is category A for hemorrhagic shock. So the person with mechanism of injury, some reason to make you think they can bleed out, neck wound, right, who is unstable, gets TXA. I think the state defines unstable as tachycardic rates greater than 120, tachypnic, respirations greater than 24, hypotension, blood pressure less than 90, uh, or signs of cardiovascular compromise. Um, so I would say don't spend five minutes checking the blood pressure. Uh, if I saw that wound and he's bleeding out, I know he's going to be unstable. So Hands are on deck. I'm moving toward the rescue to head to the hospital. He needs a surgeon. Somebody's starting to mine and pushing the two grams of TXA as we move to the hospital. TXA is low risk, high yield, especially in places that are far away from a trauma center. So, no. That was going to probably be politically correct, but no. So, it will mess up a TAG, uh, but a TAG is a diagnostic test. And this is an intervention. So sometimes you got to do things that screw up your diagnostics. That cyano kit we talked about will screw up some of your ABGs too. But I don't care. If the patient's high risk from dying from the injury, they get that medication. So, yes, I know there's some facilities that don't appreciate the use of pre hospital TXA. I understand that. You have to work with those. However, the state has approved this as a category A medication to be used in hemorrhagic shock. Um, so just make sure your medical director is in agreement with that and you should be fine. Um, obviously, don't burn bridges at facilities you got to transport to. And I understand that those uh, places have concerns as well about management. Uh, but uh, this is standard of care at this point in the game. Um, we don't do the drip anymore. It used to be one gram and then you gave, you know, the other gram over so many hours. Now it's a one time dose, two grams. Uh, you give it over uh, technically 20 minutes, 100 milligrams a minute. Uh, most places, uh, most of the literature says you can give it over 10 minutes, and there's even some literature in some states that are doing this IV push. Our state says give it over uh, at 100 milligrams a minute, and I'll leave it at that. 
But TXA, the base of the redneck definition of how it works, when you think about it, you have an injury to a vessel, that vessel ruptures, you get bleeding, the body sends cells there. It says, oh crap, I'm bleeding, just make a clot. It clots for a few minutes and then a little while later it comes back and it says, do I need to keep these, these cells there to keep this clot up? So it breaks the clot away and it says, nope, we're still bleeding, re-clot. Right? And it does that over and over and over again. And eventually you run out of clotting material. What TXA does is it stops you from breaking that clot down. So it tells your body, again, redneck pathophysiology here or pharmacology, right? It says, don't break the clot down. So the dude that's cutting the neck, if he's got internal bleeding there, it's going to tell the body, keep whatever clot you can make, keep it there, and that buys time to get to the hospital. There is a risk of blood clots in the hospital long term for these people. That's why we don't use it on people that don't need it. Okay. There was a guy, this is back in the fall, he was shot in the back. Um, it was about four degrees outside. We cut his clothes off. He's butt naked. His heart rate was 80. Blood pressure was fine, but he is pouring sweat. All right. So he wasn't tachycardic. He wasn't hypotensive, but he had signs of cardiovascular compromise, right? Diaphoretic is dirt in four degree weather. And he had a mechanism of injury that made me think he was bleeding out. Shot in the back. So he got TXA. Only contraindications now that uh, would be uh, one, they don't need it. All right. Two, they tell you they have an anaphylaxis reaction to it. And if they do that, please text me so I know about it. All right. Because that's probably not going to happen. And then the other thing would be if it's been more than three hours since they started bleeding. And if you think about that, the reason that is if it's been more than three hours, they've already used all those clotting factors up, and TXA is not going to preserve anything. So immediately once you get it in. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm not sure what the half-life is, but Tom Owen said I could I could Google it. It doesn't from my standpoint, it doesn't matter. Again, I'm giving this to somebody that I'm looking at in my mind they're sick. And by sick, my definition is holy crap, they're gonna die or something bad's gonna happen to them in the next you know 10 minutes to an hour. So yeah. Um again, it comes different ways. It comes in a vial uh that you can draw up two grams and stick it in 250 or 500 cc's of saline or LR and this running in over that 20 minutes. I'd say label the bag some way so that the trauma center knows. And when you get to wherever you're going, make sure the hospital knows they have TXA so they know that the tag will be jacked up and they can fuss at you. And you just smile and say thank you. All right. Um, it also comes pre-mixed in one gram and 100 mils. Um, so however you get it the cheapest is fine. You can hang two of these or you can put two grams in that. If all you have is one gram, don't think you can't give it. Give one gram. And when you get to the hospital, say, hey, I only had one gram. They need the second gram. But this was updated on the state website the other day. Uh, the previous kind of talks I've done talked about this. It was not, but again, if you look at this, consider TXA, advanced intermediate paramedic or critical care. TXA can be used for other things. These are not category A uses, and this is an old slide, so don't look at this dosing. That is not correct. Uh, but TXA can be used for uh, head bleeds. We give it uh, where I work for any head injury. GCS less than like 13, head injury, they get TXA, especially if there's blood in the head to stop that bleeding. You can use it for nosebleed. Sometimes I'll take a nasal packet uh, sponge and squirt TXA on it and gently place it in the nose. Uh, I shove it in the nose hole, right? And that uh, works. So it works topically. You can put it on wounds. Uh, if somebody has a pulmonary mass, and it kind of eats into a vessel in the lungs. You got pulmonary hemorrhage or coughing up blood. You can nebulize it. Um, it can also be used for angioedema. There's some data that people who take ACE inhibitors like the Sinopril, Fosinopril, and they get the tongue swelling from that, that you can give them a gram of TXA or about 10 minutes, and it can reverse that. Um, so those are all category B. You'd have to call your med control to get approval for that. Um, but uh, when I'm working, the folks that I work with know that some of those things are reasonable and we'll say yes to that. But again, those are category B, not category A. Any drug that's in your formulary is an advanced EMT or a medic or an EMT. You can give it. It's category A as the protocol is written. It's category B if you call and ask for orders for it. It was like magnesium years ago. We used a lot of mag for respiratory problems, but you had a call to get orders. Now it's in the protocols. I'm not going to talk about trauma cystic entry. Don't have time. We're in a few minutes behind. The intermediate, there's still about 100, 120 intermediates out in the state. Um, 
And I'll bring this couple of practice up to show that the, at the intermediate level, they can intubate and they can also do uh, defib and synchronized cardioversion. And then let's take a break and we'll finish up and talk about parabetics. All right, so let's do about five minutes. That's okay. Good with you, Chief. All right, that can be an EKG class, but I think we all can recognize that is abnormal. That should make you use profanity. Uh, the first question you see when you see that EKG is, do they have a pulse, right? Um, if you're doing a 12 lead, I hope they have a pulse, right? You should never see a 12 lead of that. They don't have a pulse because you should be doing other things to them, right? Um, so drugs we can use to treat this or what? So this guy, he's sitting on the side of his couch. Uh, he's diaphoretic. He says he feels like he's going to pass out. Heart rate is what you see. Blood pressure is 100 over 60. He's breathing 30 times a minute and his sats are 94%. What are you going to do for him after you use profanity? So you can cardiovert, right? So that's category A now, right? What else could you do for this guy? Do amiodarone or lidocaine, right? So you got a couple of options. You got medicines or you got electricity, right? So American Heart says if someone's unstable, they get electricity, you fire them up, right? Synchronized cardioversion. American Heart defines unstable is they say they have chest pain, they have shortness of breath, they feel weak, they feel dizzy, or they're hypertensive, they're altered. So I would bet you all the cash I have, all $7, that if somebody has this rhythm, they're gonna have one of those complaints. They're gonna be sweaty, feel bad, have shortness of breath or something, right? So I do things a little bit different. Um, I use ultra mental status as my guide. Do I use electricity right off the bat or do I try medications first? Um, we're not gonna talk. So with those guys, stability is do they have a pulse? And then definition in the protocol book, it is, don't laugh at me, that's okay. Um, so I use ultra mental status is, is my deciding factor, right? So if dude's sitting on the side of the bed, diaphoretic looks like dirt, not talking to me or just saying weird things, yeah, I'm gonna put my leads on, put my pads on, and I'm gonna say, hang on, sir, and synchronize cardiovert, right? If he's talking to me in alert, I'm probably gonna go pre-oxygenation, right? Put him on my pads, put him on my leads, start an IV, and think about drugs first. People don't appreciate being cardioverted if they're awake and alert. If they're a little bit altered, then they're kind of self-sedated, it's okay. But there are not many people that I cardiovert without sedation unless they're self-sedated being altered. Now, this is category A, so you can cardiovert if they need it, or you can start with medicines. Um, and that's gonna be your decision to make out what needs to be done. Uh, but for me, personally, in the places that I work, my recommendation is, if they're still alert and mentating well, I'm gonna try amnio or lidocaine first. They're gonna be, I'm gonna be ready. They're gonna have pre-oxygenation. They're gonna have the pads on. If they decompensate, I'm not gonna hesitate. I'm gonna hit the sync button, I'm gonna charge, and I'm gonna light them up, right? Uh, if they're a little bit altered, kind of groggy, not looking really well, then I'm gonna put the leads on, put the pads on. I'm gonna synchronize cardiovert, and then somebody can come back in, start the line, and we're gonna go from there. Does that make sense? So there are several ways to manage this patient and you need to be ready to think about it because in the past, you didn't really have a choice. You'd have to call a doctor cardiovert. Now you can make that decision, okay? I can show you, I can't show you, I can let you listen to recordings of people calling in to get a cardiovert and we say yes and you hear the patient talk and you think, I hope that's not the patient. And then a few minutes later, you hear profanity yelled loudly and it worked, but they probably could have been fine with medication or maybe you consider sedation for the medicines before you cardiovert them if they're really awake. Does that make sense? Cool. Do y'all sedate your cardioversion patients? Yes. Yeah, if they're awake, yeah. If they're about, if they're circling the drain, they look like dirt, altered, no sedation for you. But if they're talking to me, I don't want them to know my name if I'm gonna cardiovert them, right? I said, my name is Dr. Brown. Hi. Ah, that was funny. All right, sorry. So amio or lidocaine, either way, you don't have to carry both for the state. Amio is 150 over 10 minutes, all right? And, uh, and stable-ish, I mean, the alive VTAC or lidocaine, either one works well. I would not go both routes. I would not give amio, wait 10 minutes. That didn't work, just give them some lidocaine. I would not do that. You pick a path, like pick a path adventure. That adventure works out, great. If it doesn't, the next pathway is Call for orders to sedate them and synchronize cardiovert them.
I do AMIO because it's more versatile. So I can use AMIO for um, uh, AFib, uh, RVR, that's kind of unstable, so I don't want to cardiovert them. I can use it for A flood or ATAC. You can use it for SVT, or you can use it for VTAC. Vitacane is really just VTAC. So, so yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe in the inpatient setting, but I, I don't, at least I don't care. That's not clinically appropriate from the EMS or ER side. Um, AMIO is not good long term. We don't do a lot of AMIO drips because it's pretty bad on the lungs. So um, very seldom, if ever, do I do a AMIO push, then a drip, or a lot of cane push, and then a drip. I give the one dose uh, push. If that works, great. I move to the hospital. I'm prepared to cardiovert if it comes back. If that one dose doesn't work in a few minutes, then I'm going to probably call and get orders to sedate and zap them. Can't say zap. And synchronized cardiovert them. So if, uh, I, I'm not a big fan of the drips. And again, hospital, uh, most hospitals aren't doing long-term amio drips. Now there's the exception, some folks you have to, but for most people that manage is pretty good. What are the two most common causes of VTAC or VFib? You can't say death. That's the outcome of what happens when you get it. So uh, ischemia. So somebody's having a big freaking STEMI or STEMI bad heart disease. So you push the AMIO or you shock them and they get better. You do a 12 lead and it says STEMI, you got your answer, right? All right. The other problem, the thing that causes this is structural heart disease, congestive heart failure. The bigger your heart gets, it stretches out, it jacks up the conduction pathways. Again, that's redneck pathophysiology, um, but they're a higher risk to having VTAC and VFib. That's why we put um, internal defibrillators and pacers in people with congestive heart failure, because they're high risk. For going into that and that's why i also think my opinion personally is that while we're seeing less v-fib primary v-fib arrest in the communities because we have all the people with bad heart disease that now have internal defibrillators so now instead of them dying going to v-fib all right they go into v-fib they get shocked internally and then they call us hey my defibrillator just went off my like, goodness supposed to say thank you all right who likes cats Nobody. Good. Good answer. All right. Adenosine uh, used to be Cat B for SVT. Now it's Category A. All right. So narrow complex tachy that's regular. Adenosine is a good drug. How do you know if this is regular or irregular? Trick question. Good yeah. Good job. Yeah. Going this fast. It looks pretty regular, but I got my glasses on and it's really freaking fast and I can't count those boxes. Right. So I'm going to lay my hands on the pulse. Narrow complex feels regular. That's SVT. Touch the patient appropriately. Touch the patient. <laughs> Somebody said, Dr. Ferguson told me to touch the patient. Nope. So adenosine is quick on, quick off. It blocks the AV node. So it stops. Right. And then the heart can reset. Pretty useful stuff. So it's chemical cardioversion. All right. It's safe for all narrow complex tachys. American Heart says you can give it for some Y complex tachys. If you think it's SVT, I don't do that uh, because I get confused some days uh, when I've been working long shifts, like the back end of a 48, right? So if I got a Y complex tachy that's irregular and they got a pulse and it's really AFib, RVR with aberrancy, they can have an accessory path rate through the heart somewhere else. If I block the AV node, in theory, you can make them go from AFib to VFib, right? Does it really happen? Who knows? Uh, but for me personally, I use a denison for narrow complex tachys uh, that are regular. Um, what do you want to tell your patient before you push a denison? Yeah, hold on. Surprise. You surprise them? Yeah, yeah. So um, I usually try vagal maneuvers first, have them blowing the thumb, blowing the syringe, you have them bear down. Um, I don't do that new thing where you have them blowing a syringe and throw their feet up in the air, do all that stuff. Most of my patients are too big to do that. And if I throw them off the stretcher, then I got to pick them back up and I can't do that. So blowing a syringe, bear down. If that doesn't work, I'm going to start a line and push a denizen. I try to put them onto leads, hit print. So as I run this, we can go back later and look at it and say, oh, actually it was atrial tachycardia, not SVT. We can do some diagnosis. Uh, but in reality, the goal is to fix this rate. Um, so a denizen starts a line. As I push it, I kind of reach down and say, you can feel like dirt for a second, sorry. And then, right? They should moan and groan. They should complain for a second. You should always see this pause. If you don't see the pause when you push it, the medicine did not get to them, all right? What's the dose of adenosine? 
yep, 6, 12, and 12. I usually do 12 the first time in the hospital, but I think for you guys, it's still 6, 12, and 12. Um, but it's category A, all right? Um, really limited risk to this drug. Um, everybody likes to put them on the pads because we all freak out because they go assistedly for a few minutes. That's fine. Uh, but I've not really seen ever seen a bad outcome with this. Occasionally, I push to denison, and then I see what looks like flutter waves or baby VTAC, right? And I go, oh, that wasn't SVT. That was atrial flutter. Diagnosis made. But did it hurt the patient? Didn't hurt them. Same thing with AFib, right? We talked about aspirin earlier at the paramedic level. If somebody's having a STEMI, I give them an aspirin. The only reason I don't give them an aspirin, if they say they have anaphylaxis to it. If they say I took an aspirin two hours ago, I'm like, good, thank you very much. Here's another one. I don't trust patients. I've been tricked. They may have taken an oxy or Norco or fentanyl tablet or something weird, right? I don't, I don't trust them, all right? Um, no aspirin in a STEMI is bad. Two aspirin, meh, it could be bad, but it's worse if you don't get one, right? So. STEMI patient at the medic level, get an aspirin. Atropine, um, so again, we're not gonna talk about, it, about EKGs, but uh, atropine is great for bradycardia. I know a lot of folks don't like it because uh, it doesn't work a lot of the times, and I agree, sometimes it doesn't, especially with high-grade heart blocks, but there's really no risk to it, and it's easy to use, and it's, most medics are very comfortable with it. So somebody's got a heart rate of 40, they're symptomatic, they gotta be symptomatic too, right? Heart rate's 40, a little bit altered, hypotensive. I'm starting IV fluids, I'm getting an AccuCheck, sitting them up, I'm gonna pre-oxygenate them. I'm gonna pop one to atropine. If that works, great, I high five my partner. If it doesn't work, I move on down the road, right? Calcium is another great drug. Calcium is, uh, increases intracellular calcium, so it increases heart rate and blood pressure normally. Uh, the other thing with calcium is it used to treat what? What just really? Hyperkalemia, so. Um, Hyperkalemia causes slow and wide rhythms. This is really hyperkalemia gone wild. So the first thing you think about is, uh, does this patient have a pulse, right? So if you're doing a 12 lead, I hope they have a pulse. So 12 leads look like this, this is hyperkalemia. And then that's the patient that's diaphoretic, grunting, and almost dead. Then it's a big STEMI, right? Uh, but that's hyperkalemia. So calcium is category A in hyperkalemia. When you see slow rhythms, I think about drugs, electrolytes, or ischemia causing this. Um, this is one of my favorite slides coming up, but the way you manage this hyperkalemia is calcium. It's the three S's. You stabilize the membrane, right? Uh, what's another drug you can give after calcium? What drug would you give? Albuterol. Albuterol. So albuterol starts shifting the potassium back into the cell. It's 20 milligrams. That's a big freaking dose. So you're going to dump four to five, four to eight, depending on your strength of uh, albuterol in there and give them a NEB treatment. If you have the dual NEBs, the ipotropium bromide or atrovent and albuterol, same thing. Give them 20 milligrams of the albuterol portion. It's not gonna hurt them. Sometimes you see that EKG start changing as you're doing the NEB treatment. Works pretty good. The critical care folks, the folks in the hospital would do insulin and D50. That's not for us in the field, most of us. And then the last thing we wanna do to get the potassium down is we remove it or excrete it. We do that by dialysis. And we also can excrete it by giving you a medicine that makes you have diarrhea. That is my favorite slide in the world. Okay, exhalate we use in the hospital. If you're doing an interfacility transport, make sure you're not giving K exhalate before you start transporting because your back of your rescue is going to be bad. There's some new drugs out there. How do you say that? The Kelma or something? Have y'all used that much in the ER? A few times? Yeah, I'm not a big fan of it. The nurses hate me if you give that because they start all pooping. So. Um, you can usually manage hyper, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's a contact thing. You touch the box, you start pooping automatically. Um, but um, usually you can manage hyperkalemia medically. Uh, the calcium, the albuterol, just repeat that until the EKG gets better. All right. That's the female monkey. Um, so this is hyperkalemia here. The machine again. For those of you that watch our EKG stuff, don't trust your machine. This says STEMI, yeah. maybe, uh, but this patient was also uh, fluid volume overload, missed dialysis. That's their EKG. They get calcium, they get albuterol, they get IV fluids, just a little bit because they're dialysis. Um, they got more calcium, more albuterol, and that's their EKG fixed a few hours later. So you can actually fix that before you get to the hospital if you're fairly aggressive with it, but you got to be able to recognize it first. So. And then dopamine, again, this is Cat A. I like dopamine for bradycardia. 
It's quick and it's simple. Spike the bag, hang the line, open it up, give it a minute to run. If your patient gets better, great. Slow it down to 10 mics per kilo per minute. Break out your cheat sheet. If they don't get better, not so great, but bring out your cheat sheet, throw it down to 10 mics per kilo per minute, and move on down to your next drug. Push dose epi probably works better for most people, but again, if you're gonna be doing push dose epi at the paramedic level, make sure you know how to mix it up. Giving somebody half a milligram of epi one to 10 changes them from bradycardia to tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, and it's pretty cool. You get to shock somebody, but it's bad for the patient, right? So just the algorithms in the books. Remember, the protocol book should not be your only source of knowledge, just like EMS Challenge should not be your only source of education. There are a lot of resources out there. This should be kind of a guide so that you know what you can do this CAT A versus what you got to call for. So this is all CAT A stuff at the paramedic level, which is great if you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, it's time to figure it out, right? And you can still call med control. Just because you don't have to doesn't mean you can't. If you have a question, Call for help, phone a friend before you hurt somebody. And then pacing. So I use, uh, for my patients that I'm gonna pace, same thing like we talked about for cardioversion. My threshold to pace first versus medication is mental status. Obviously they gotta have bradycardia, they gotta be symptomatic, low blood pressure, feel like dirt, not doing well. If they're completely altered and gorked out, now I'm thinking about bagging them, I'm probably gonna throw the pads on and try to pace immediately, very reasonable. OK, if they're still talking to me, I'm probably going to start my fluids and my meds first before I make them cuss me at 60 beats a minute. But before you pace somebody, make sure it's not hyperkalemia, because if you pace hyperkalemia, you're not going to figure out later on down the road you're going to kill somebody. Talked about that. ABCs, atropine, calcium, dopamine, epi, pace. Most people that I pace, I end up intubating as well. Dilt, diltiazem is a calcium channel blocker, it's optional. Most places I work, I'm not gonna let folks do that just because I think that AFib, RVR that you control with dilt, you gotta look for the underlying problem. So usually they, they're septic, they're febrile or hypotensive because of the fluid volume status. You look for those reasons first, and then you can slowly add dilt. The good news is that the diltiazem dose that we have is fairly low, so if you were using it, most folks would be fine with it. But AFib, RVR, I know it's AFib, not because the machine says so. I know it's AFib because my hand is on their pulse and it's irregular. And I just defined AFib RVR. In the past, we talked about in the hospital how we control this stuff. Uh, and it was based upon time. So AFib decreases cardiac output. It puts you at high risk for throwing clots, having a stroke or a PE. So if somebody had AFib for more than 48 hours, a lot of times we control the rate to slow the rate down. We give them blood thinners, and then we have the cardiologist fix them a few days later so we don't throw a clot. If it was less than 48 hours, then we'd say, okay, maybe we will synchronize cardiovert you, sedate you, give you other drugs that can fix that rhythm. Um, and that was kind of old school. It was kind of confusing at times. You just, it, depending on which cardiologist you talked to, which book you looked at, um, in reality, most of the time now, we're going to do rate control in the hospital, control that rate, make sure nothing else is going on with them, fix the underlying problem, and then go back to cardiologist a few weeks later and get an ablation to fix the AFib. But even then, most folks that get ablated for AFib will come back a few years later and be an AFib again. Um, it's just a pretty common dysrhythmia. Um, unstable AFib is one of the scariest rhythms you ever see. Uh, people who have AFib RVR and they have bad heart failure, their heart rate gets faster and faster because they got to pump more blood out. Um, so AFib RVR hypotensive, and I think they're unstable AFib because of the heart rate, and I cardiovert them or give them diltiazem, I slow that heart rate down, and the problem wasn't the heart rate. The problem is their heart is not pumping well. I drop their blood pressure. I'll make them worse by that. My point to that rambling is if you give somebody diltiazem, if you cardiovert somebody that's an AFib, and they go from looking like dirt, hypotensive, tachycardic, to looking like they're almost dead, normal heart rate, worse hypotension, you gotta fix that fast. And you fix that, if you give them DILT, you fix a calcium channel blocker by giving them calcium, right? If you shock them, and now they're back in sinus rhythm, but the heart rate's too slow and they look like worse, you gotta get their blood pressure up. 
So dobutamine, if you have access to that, if not, it's going to be fluids and maybe even some dopamine or something like that. Um, AFib RVR that's unstable is one of the scariest rhythms to manage, in my opinion. Those guys are just bad, sick hearts. Anybody, y'all still carry Haldol or y'all doing just ketamine now? Just ketamine, cool. So Haldol is old school antipsychotic. If somebody has underlying schizophrenia or acute psychosis due to those issues, works good. Problem is it just takes too long to work, right? It takes eight firemen to hold somebody down for 20 minutes versus ketamine, which takes eight firemen for like three minutes, right? Cool. Ketamine, uh, places I work, I'm only using ketamine for excited delirium, different generations of hulks. That's for some of you, that's for the newer folks, right? Um, but excited delirium, that's the guy who's butt naked, uh, fighting the police, doing everything, uh, got tased and still doesn't affect him. Uh, ketamine is a great drug for that. Remember, ketamine is ideal body weight, so it's height based, not weight based. So these guys get the same dose. These guys get a different dose. There are a lot of freaking formulas out there that I can't remember. All right. Um, I use 52 kilograms of five foot and two kilos per inch to get ideal body weight. All right. Um, it's, you think about dosing this is almost like the height based or Braslo for adults. Um, to be gender neutral, I switch it instead of doing 52 for guys. I just say everybody's 50. So I know my height. I can look at the guy over there and say, okay, he's he's probably six two. So he's gonna. I'm gonna calculate my dose based upon his height, not how chunky he is. Okay. So if I got a guy that's five foot six, 350 pounds, about 160 kilos. If I did four bigs per kilo for him, I'd give him 640 milligrams of ketamine. That's popping open two vials. That should be a red flag. It's too much, right? All right. Versus ideal body weight, he gets 248 milligrams or 250, 260, something close to that. So big dosing difference there. So if you're going four mg per kilo, make sure you're doing it on ideal body weight. If not, cut the dose in half. The other thing is the state has now put a cap on this. 400 milligrams is max dose for anybody. 400 milligrams of ketamine should make most anybody chillax enough for you to manage them. Ketamine is a great drug, but remember uh, people who get ketamine are now critical patients. They never go to jail. Have y'all been following the cases in Colorado and out west? There have been several cases. There was um, one where they got ketamine. Uh, the medics gave ketamine to a guy that was in police custody. And they said he had a, started at the hospital, didn't recognize he had a respiratory failure. The dude died. The medics got criminally charged with that, uh, uh, with that patient. Uh, there was no one in Colorado, and I've already forgot it. The one where they. Salter told the medic to give ketamine, but she gave a slug of midazolam for it, then gave ketamine. Yeah. Yeah. So there have been several ketamine cases. There was uh, one uh, in the Midwest where there was a guy that was shot in the head. Uh, and med control went on the scene and they said the guy's not going to survive. We're not going to transport. We're going to do a death and field protocol. Um, but well, the dude that was shot in the head started moaning. So they gave him ketamine. So obviously he wasn't dead, right? Uh, so a lot of issues. My point being, ketamine is uh, very newsworthy. Um, uh, and there are a lot of aggressive prosecutors out there. There was a, uh, a medic that got prosecuted for diverting ketamine. They lost their license. This is in our state. Uh, and they also got criminally charged for diverting, uh, even though they only diverted to themselves. And they got over a year in jail, federal prison for that. So, so we have a recent case too. Yeah. Yeah, so my point being, um, ketamine gets a lot of news time, gets a lot of uh, look over by people. Uh, so be very wise with your ketamine. Um, it is a safe drug when used appropriately. Uh, and it's a safe drug when once used, you assess your patient and manage your patient appropriately. Uh, but it will make the news highlights if you screw up. So be careful. People that get ketamine are critical. Once they get the ketamine and you're able to safely assess them, you expose them, you cut their clothes off, you get them naked, right? You look for patches, you look for holes, you look for things that kill people. You get a glucose, they get on the cardiac monitor, you get an EKG. If you have entitled capnography, you use that. If they get hypoxic, you do not put oxygen on them. They get hypoxic because they're not breathing well. They get hypoxic, you open the airway, send them back, jaw thrust. If that works, great, call it a day. If it doesn't, they get a nasal trumpet or an OPA. If that works, great. If it doesn't, they get O2 attached to a BVM and you ventilate. 
If they lose their gag reflex, you intubate them. Standard of care. All right. What you can't do is you can't give somebody ketamine, 400 ketamine. They calm down. You're happy they're not fighting, spitting on you. You throw them on your stretcher. Their sats go to 80. You put them on a non rebreather because what's happening is they're not breathing deep enough, right? They build up CO2. 20 minutes later, they go into cardiac arrest, and you're like, oh, what the heck happened? What happened was they got hypercapnic. So ketamine is a great drug, but use it wisely. There's still some ERs that I've worked at where I can't get ketamine as an ER doctor to use in the ER. I have to walk down to the pharmacy, tap on the window. Can I get some ketamine for my patient that's beating up my nurses, right? So we have it in the field. It's fantastic, but be wise. Like in the church. I don't recommend using it for pain. You can use it for pain. Places that I work as a medical director, this is going to be category B or if I'm running out of fentanyl and morphine just because of dosing errors. If I got 500 milligrams of ketamine in a 5cc vial, and I'm going to give somebody 11 milligrams of ketamine. How much volume is that? I couldn't even see it with my glasses on, right? Yeah, so you, your math is much better than me. I'm from Mississippi. We can't do that kind of math, sir. Right, so um, be wise with that as well, okay? There was a patient that I had recently that I gave uh, 50 of ketamine IV for pain control-ish to put a chest tube in them. And as I'm putting the chest tube in, they just quit breathing completely. Remember, our patients are not NPO past midnight, right? They're not prepared for these things. They've probably been drinking beer, smoking some weed, doing some fentanyl, and we add a little bit of ketamine on them, we can push them over the edge, so. This is the cheat sheet that I use where I work. Um, kind of the yellow is for excited delirium, and it's based on hot height. So the, at two in the morning, when you're on your second 24 hour shift, you got a way to say, OK, I think I got the dose right. I'm breaking out my cheat sheet. That's what I got. And this is the pain. And it's in red to tell you only use it if we have no fentanyl or morphine or something else. All right. So if you're sitting on the side of the road, you got no narcotics. Patients got an open femur, they're screaming. Yeah, give them some ketamine, give them some pain control, but give them the right dose. Ketamine, 400 milligram max. So this was recently updated uh, a few days ago on the website. Uh, this is the pain control algorithm. So Tylenol was there for the EMT or anybody that needs to use it. We talked about Toradol, <clears throat> we talked about the risk. Morphine is for the paramedics and fentanyl as well, and then ketamine. Dosage, morphine, two to four milligrams every five minutes. Really no max. The fentanyl is 25 to 100 mics every 20 minutes. The previous edition said every three. Uh, really no max dose, right? My advice would be talk to your medical director, figure out what your max dose, max dose is. Um, you probably don't want to be giving somebody 400 mics of fentanyl over the course of the long transport, but maybe you do. Um, Q20 minutes is actually more a lot more reasonable than Q3 minutes. Hey, Doc. Yes, sir. So there's been some questions texted to me about this specifically, so I'm glad you went over it. And sure. this is a pretty ridiculous question, but I've had several people ask it. So that means morphine or fentanyl or toradol, not morphine and fentanyl and toradol. But could it mean toradol and either fentanyl and morphine? <laughs> So I would say that I would not do morphine, fentanyl, and ketamine, right? That's kind of pushing the limits of logic. If you give somebody a little bit of Toradol and they fit the bill, that young person, healthy, no kidney problems, right? You give them some Toradol, doesn't work, 15, 20 minutes down the road, sure, go back and give one of these. But I would not do four morphine, 100 of fentanyl, five minutes later, four morphine, Five minutes later, four morphine, and then at 20 minutes, 100 of fentanyl. I, that is not the way I interpret that. I would say the ideal situation is you, the medical director where you work, uh, you have a face-to-face, -face or they kind of give you an idea of what they want to do, so we're all on the same page. Does that make sense? What if somebody is on uh, in has a, an opioid use disorder? and they're on uh, chronic naloxone or suboxone, and now they're in a car wreck and got an open femur. Say they're 30, got an open femur, car wreck, you got a 40 minute transport. They need some pain control because even folks who have chronic pain and use opioids can have injuries, they need pain control, right? 
can you use morphine or fentanyl for them? Probably not, because they're already on drugs that kind of reverse the effect of that, right? So that person may get a little bit of Toradol and then get some ketamine, and that would be an exception to my rule will I work where you don't use ketamine, okay? And that's still, this is all category A for you guys. So these are things you gotta think about and how you're gonna manage that and be ready for that. There's a lot of autonomy coming to you guys for category A, which is great. Gives you a chance to do the right thing for the patient in front of you. You don't have to call and get orders. It's not based upon which doctors at the hospital when you call, it's based upon your knowledge and what the protocol state. But there's also a lot of responsibility that you don't screw up and hurt somebody. It's so we're also getting a question about ketamine and respiratory depression. Yeah. So apparently there's some academic literature that explicitly says that ketamine doesn't remove or reduce respiratory drive, but that doesn't seem to line up with what we see in the field. Yeah, I've seen that too, and I, I don't, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't, I don't believe it, to be honest with you. And the other thing is you also got to think that some patients, some of these studies where people are getting ketamine and they're looking at respiratory drive, they're also not out there smoking weed, drinking beer, popping oxys, doing other things. So we have a different patient population. Um, again, the joke earlier we talked about, you get two doctors in a room, ask their opinion, you get six opinions. You're going to have other opinions as well. Uh, but I can tell you, I can show you cases where folks have gotten big doses of ketamine, they don't breathe. And there's a lot of literature to back that up. Yes, sir. I did have a patient that uh, we gave ketamine to because he didn't know the way to control it. Yeah. And he did uh, put him on cat and then uh, maybe 10 minutes into the, the transport, uh, it alerted in apnea, we were watching it, and then he turned blue and we had to back and through it. It took us like yeah. 10 minutes to back and through it, and then after that, he was fine the rest of the transport. Yeah. So every drug has a risk and a benefit. Uh, ketamine may be safer than the other drugs that we use for excited delirium. It may not be, um, but um, you got to be prepared for that airway. Docs in the back, what do y'all think? Yeah. Yeah, and for the hospital folks online and the docs here, if you're sedating somebody with ketamine, do you put them on uh, capnography and do you watch their airway every time? Yeah, so why do we do that? Because it can do that. It can sedate you too much, put you down. Okay. <clears throat> Levada law, we won't talk a lot about Levada law. It's category B. I know time's running out. Levada law is an antihypertensive drug from an ER doctor standpoint. Hypertension doesn't scare me. Uh, what makes me uncomfortable is a patient who has other signs with their hypertension. So uh, the 40 year old blood pressure 260 over 140 that's gurgling, sitting upright, hypoxic, huffing and puffing. When you listen to them, they got fluid in the lungs and they're hypertensive. What do they need? They need CPAP, maybe some nitro. They're in heart failure, the fluid volume overloaded, right? They don't need a blood pressure drug. They need something to dilate them. I want to control the blood pressure, I use nitro for that, right? Um, the lady with chest pain, blood pressure 170 over 102. Again, I'm concerned about hypertension, chest pain, abnormal EKG. She gets nitro, not levetalol. The patient with right sided weakness, been going on for an hour. You do your IMSA stroke scale, you recognize they're sick, they're having a stroke, blood pressure is high. Are we going to give this person? Levada law, this is an old slide here, don't look at this one. No, no right, because if they're having a <clears throat> ischemic stroke, a blood clot, I want that blood pressure high to perfuse the brain. If they're having a hemorrhagic stroke, I want the blood pressure low. But how do I know? I have to get a CAT scan, right? I get it, we can tell sometimes. If I got a guy with acute onset of a headache, left side of weakness talking to me, I put him on the rescue, I head to the hospital. Now he's kind of altered, I'm like, what's going on? Now he's not moving air and he's obtunded, yeah, he's getting worse. He's got blood in his head. I get it, right? Uh, but for the most part, you can't tell. And even that scenario I just gave you, I'm not going to treat his blood pressure in the field. I'm going to manage his airway. I'm going to get an AccuCheck. I'm going to put hypoxia. I'm going to get to the hospital quickly to know my concerns. And me as the ER doctor, I'm going to scan him and I'm going to follow him to CT scanner. And if I see blood, second I see the blood, I'll lower his blood pressure. If I don't see blood, I'm not. Because you can actually make somebody worse by lowering blood pressure with an acute ischemic stroke. 
We give everybody having a stroke IV fluids, right? 500 cc bolus. Why do we do that? To increase perfusion of the brain. We're trying to save the brain. The brain. Go ahead. Um, starting at 23, everybody's got to either have morphine or fentanyl um, for pain control. Nicardipine, norepinephrine. Uh, nicardipine is also a calcium channel blocker. It's used for hypertensive emergencies. If you're doing interfacility transfers, you may want to carry that again, but you'd use that after your person has had their CT. Somebody who gets TPA for an ischemic stroke, we keep their blood pressure lower because we don't want them to have a bleed after that TPA because they could die from that. So that's when you would use that. Anybody carrying nitrous oxide? Only time I ever see it is like in New Orleans and it's in a balloon. It costs like $8. Yeah, that's a joke. Okay, um, we talked about pacing when to pace and anybody carrying uh, gastric tubes? Yeah, y'all have them? Okay, I think I just thought I was talking about a second. The other thing I want to talk about is attention pneumothorax and chest decompression. This is category A as well. Um, remember, tension pneumothorax is a pneumothorax, and now they have signs of tension, which is either cardiac arrest or altered mental status and hypotension, confusion, signs of cardiovascular compromise. So remember, altered mental status should be your guiding point for this, and they got to have a pneumothorax. So dude shot in the chest, diminished breath sounds, a little bit hypoxic, you throw some O2 on, you head into the hospital. Now he becomes altered, obtunded, drops his SAT, and his heart rate goes from 140, 120, 90. He's got concerns for pneumothorax because he was shot in the chest. Now he has signs of tension. I'm going to needle that chest. I'm probably already pushing TXA, and I'm moving to the hospital. So you decompress a tension pneumothorax. When you get so much air in the lungs, it pushes everything over, decreases the blood return to the heart. People can die from that. Anterior or lateral approach. I like the anterior just because I think it's easier. Folks in Alabama can be chunky uh, and you can be less chunky anteriorly. Some folks have a lot of space to go through laterally. The other thing that I've seen is people use the nipple line is the landmark of how far, how low to go. And some people's nipple line are in different locations where they should be. Um, so you got to go by the anatomical nipple line, right? You want to be really high and lateral. If you go too low, you put a needle in the belly, and that does not decompress the chest. Uh, and I know we're smiling about that, uh, but I can show you x-rays of that, and that's poor form. So this is category A. If the patient needs this, do it. Save a life, all right? But make sure you know what you're doing. Um, in August, if y'all want to come down to Birmingham, I'll have another lab in August where we have cadavers. We can practice this as well. I know Huntsville does that too. So. OG tubes, these are great post-intubation airway management device. So uh, a lot of folks weren't trained on these in medic school, but you basically take the tube, you measure from the nose hole to the ear, to the sternum, put a piece of tape over that there so you got it marked. And post-arrest, you get ROS, they're intubated. You take this, you lube it up, and you gently place it in the mouth hole to where the tape is, hook the suction, and you should be good to go. If you place it and they desat, have problems, probably went in the wrong hole. The good thing is, if you got an ET tube in, there's only one hole left to hit. Unless they've been shot or stabbed up there. If they've been shot or stabbed, don't put anything in there. Does that make sense? Sweet. Post intubation sedation, this is a new protocol. So you got some that you intubated in cardiac arrest. That is now you got ROS gone. They're biting, chewing the tube, looking around. You want to sedate them? State says, go for it. You can use fentanyl, you can use Versed, you can use ketamine. Talk to your med director, figure out what you like to use. Obviously, if the patient was a cardiac arrest, they got Narcan because they've been shooting up heroin. Now they're awake, alive, and you got them tube. We don't want you pulling that tube. You can't use fentanyl because you gave them Narcan. They get Versed. Maybe they get ketamine. But this is category A, right? Syncope. Syncope, nothing really changed in the protocols. I just want to throw this out there with a lot of BLS response and EMT level response. People that syncopize, that fall out, that faint, whatever you want to call it, those people are high risk for having a bad outcome, cardiac dysrhythmia. All patients that syncopize should have a 12 lead EKG done. I would argue that all syncope is ALS. I cannot tell you how many charts I looked at where there's been a patient that had been called for a lift assist. EMS gets there, they help them out, do things. Patient doesn't go to the hospital. 
And sometime in the next 24 hours, lo and behold, we're doing a cardiac arrest of that same scene on that same patient because they're having some kind of dysrhythmia. This is a very high risk patient and there are easy things we can do to pick up concerning factors and a 12 lead is one of them. So this is just a picture. I may have some inappropriate ones in a second too, I don't know. Um, I like this, this is at Five Below, these toys, right? This is what I got from the internet, this is from Five Below. But you see the doctor's got bigger arms than the EMT, you see that? I went to med school for the big arms. Um, but my point to this side is that the work that EMS does, um, you know, you guys are more than healthcare providers. It's like saying this guy's a day laborer. He's not a day laborer, he's a Chuck Norris guy, right? Same thing as you guys. I appreciate what you do. You work in a very complicated environment as a profession. Uh, medicine has kind of left you out to dry sometimes, and we got to fix that. Okay. I like this quote. EMS ear work is humbling, and humility is like a bacillin shot. The 2.5, 2.4 million dollar million unit dose. That's the inside joke for the hospital people. Anybody know what that dose is used for? That's what you use to treat syphilis. So humility is like a by sunshot, work it off. If you make a mistake in healthcare and pre-hospital care, walk it off, we all make mistakes. Everybody's had that airway that's kind of going south, that EKG you missed, that IV you missed. We all have those things. Uh, the way you get better is you train, you practice, you keep moving forward, keep learning, doing the right thing. Don't get your kind of just from us. There are great websites out there. There's some EM bot plot plod podcast. Sorry, I had a TIA podcast. There's EM rap. There's life in the fast lane. There's a lot of good resources. Um, next time you take ACLS or PALS, actually stay awake, read the book, think about it, because this is all you guys now. Everything's category A. Um, you are the provider. Questions, comments, statements within reason. So, Doc, we had a couple of specific questions come in online. Yes, Both sir. of them are about ketamine. Sure. Uh, the first question is, um, is there a specific reason why we do ketamine slow IV push? Thoughts on the pain management dose using ketamine if we mixed in a 250 milliliter normal saline bag and titrated? So I think the mixing and infusing it that way is very reasonable. I don't see that. I think there would be a problem with that. Um, it gives you a more controlled way to give it so it's slower. Yeah, that seems very reasonable. And rate of administration, I think that's just based upon the, the how fast the medicine works when it gets to you. So old school sedation, we used to take Versed to sedate people for cardioversion or to intubate, and would just slam it in them, all right? And they would just go out for a few minutes and then wait back up versus giving a little bit slower, you get a longer, slower onset, so. Okay. Uh, the other question about ketamine is, are there specific medications that react with ketamine that add um, like ADD or ADHD meds? Uh, we have autistic children that are med control orders ketamine for these uncontrollable kids. Is that reasonable? Yeah, that's reasonable. Yeah, I'm sure there's some drug interactions with those things, but I'm not familiar with them. And if, you know, we can't carry every drug, right? So I think, you know, for acute psychosis, Haldol is a good drug. There's a drug called Geodon or Cyprexa that's probably better. There's no way for us to carry all those. So I think ketamine is a good uh, solution for what we have to do. Uh, and then we had a couple of people text me and one online ask about, there's a lot of confusion about drug boxes. And so we got EMT scope of practice, advanced EMT and paramedic. I know as an EMS officer, I've talked to you at Center okay. and I'm sticking with one box, yeah. training the people not to touch what they're not allowed to give instead of having separate access boxes, but everybody wants to hear your opinion. Yeah, so again, it goes back to my opinion, probably doesn't count, uh, but uh, places that I'm working with, I'm fine. If we, things that got to be locked up because they're, they're controlled, we got to lock them up. Uh, but I think other medicines, you don't have to separate between the EMT, the medic, or the advanced. Um, the state office would be the one that can answer that officially for us. Uh, I will say just be wise with your controlled substances, your narcotics. Uh, make sure you're watching those. There was a case uh, along the coast, a bunch of fentanyl got lost from a uh, fire. Yeah, but so just be wise with that. The other thing to think about, 
is the advanced EMT now has access to use Versed. So you got to have a way for them to have access to that if you're going to let them use that at your agency. But they should have access to Versed. They don't need access to the, the ketamine, the fentanyl, the morphine. Those are the things to think about. Uh, common sense goes a long way, but technical questions like that probably need to be addressed to the state because I have no authority to answer those. Okay. Well, we've got another technical question. Oh, good, good. good. That we can refer to the state, and that <laughs> is the critical care. Can we have critical care individuals working within an agency that's not licensed as a critical care agency? That will have to be addressed with the state as well, sir. I have some thoughts on that. I know things are moving forward, but the official answer will have to come to the state. Yes, sir. That's all we got. I feel like online. I'm in the White House giving a briefing now. That's yeah, good. you're under the gun. Whatever the CDC says. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any questions from uh, anyone here in the classroom for Dr. Ferguson? All right, so we're going to do, uh, hopefully do lunch in a little bit, and then at noon-ish. 12.30, I think is what we said. Okay, we'll, we'll start some uh, labs. Skills, skills lab, and we're going to do that down the hallway um, here in the big room in the auditorium. Uh, if you're listening online, we're at the Decatur uh, Public Safety Training Center um, that's on old Highway 31 South in Decatur, not Highway 31. South, but old highway 30. I found it this morning. Yeah, okay. Um, if you're in the area, please come by and join us. Um, thank you for participating online. If you're with us, sorry for the technical problems we had today. Uh, hopefully we, that won't happen again. And um, so next month, uh, the second Wednesday, we're at Center Point, and the fourth Wednesday, we're at Opelika. We'll be visiting with Opelika Fire, and we'll do another skills lab in Opelika. Yep. Uh, if you're in FEIC Jim's conference uh, next week, please make an effort to see Dr. Ferguson speak. He has three sessions uh, that where he's speaking, and I'm speaking in one sec session. We have some other folks from Alabama speaking at that national conference as well. So please support your Alabama folks and come to their session and, and uh, listen in. All right. If there's no other questions, we're going to end the, the virtual meeting. And thanks, everybody, for participating.